Now we're going on to different models of multidisciplinary care. I got asked to um, do an overview of this uh, segment because I'm always so excited every time I hear that people have taken on a multidisciplinary model. So that's why you get me again. Sorry, it gets a bit boring. Um, but in this session, we want to showcase four different models of multidisciplinary care that have developed in metropolitan and regional areas. In Sydney, we're lucky enough to have um, some, some big clinics, some um, clinics that were started up, and all of them really, well, the um, major clinics, were started through the commitment and enthusiasm, enthusiasm of the neurologists involved and the teams that worked with them. Um, and these have gone on um, to become larger clinics. We've, um, MND New South Wales has also helped to support some of those clinics. And they've all gone on to become research facilities and have major roles in, in motor neurone disease. However, not everyone can get to one of the major clinics. And um, today we just want to share some of those models um, that have developed in other communities, once again through the commitment of the professionals involved. And most of these models are ones that can be replicated in any community and you know, can be done without extra funding, which is always a, a difficult thing when there's you know, just not the funding around. But many of these models, most of these models have done it just on that enthusiasm. And you know, there are actually some cost savings when you're all working together because the duplication is cut down. So, so I'm going to introduce each um, uh, model, um, each group. Um, the first one is the McCarthy the multidisciplinary team and we've got Janelle Mahon and also Anne McCutcheon who will be presenting this segment. So welcome. The beginning looked a bit like this. The beginning of the multidisciplinary team commenced in approximately 2010. It was a devised idea from the then regional advisor, Robert Peterson, who could identify that there were a myriad of issues that weren't being addressed in the MacArthur area and at times duplications of service provision in the area for M&D clients' care. The aims of the group. At times it was identified that a person with M&D as well as their family were unsure who were involved with the care at... Up here. At times, it, I'll start again for this slide. At times, it was identified that the person with MND as well as their family were unsure who were involved with the care, and at times would ask the same question to numerous clinicians attending the residence. This is the team of MacArthur, and they're also pleased to have their photo taken. I must say, <laughs> the regional advisor met with myself and then the management of Allied Health to discuss if this would be viable for all concerned. So the team was brought together. The team comprises of the staff rehab specialists, speech pathologists, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, palliative care, clinical nurse consultant, regional advisor, and case managers. So this just gives you a diagram of what it looks like. We were fortunate that Health had a room at, and that the meeting could take place every two months. This is situated at Camden Hospital. We have a fantastic speech pathologist, Kylie Vella, who sets the agenda as well as records all the minutes and distributes them for the meeting. With the patient's permission, each individual case is discussed. The meeting is structured via the agenda to discuss a holistic approach for the care of the person with MND and as well as their family. The referrals come from the community allied health as well as from the N, from the regional advisor. If there is a new referral at the time of the meeting, there is allocated time to discuss the case at the end of the agenda. Each and every clinician has a valuable information and knowledge to add to these meetings and at times some brainstorming may be required. If a person is unable to attend these meetings, they can email an electronic version to, to Kali so it can be updated through the meeting. We also look at the funding that might be suitable for a person for them, for a person for them to remain in their own home, so looking at packages and so forth, as well as sourcing pieces of equipment that's not always obtainable from the association. At the end of each year, the team completes an evaluation of the year that has passed to ascertain what we have achieved and an array of outcomes benefiting the individual during their time with our team. I'm going to hand over to Anne now, the, the Motor Neuron Regional Advisor, and she can finish off. Thank you. Right. 
Hi, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Um, look, my name is Anne McCutcheon and I'm the regional advisor for the South West and the Illawarra area. So I cover the area from Bankstown down to Nowra and that encompasses Campbelltown. Campbelltown is one of the areas. Um, just for the people down in that area, they can access two of the MND clinics, the private one with the Macquarie um, one by Professor Rowe and the public one at Prince of Wales. But that's a lot of travelling for people. So people, some people do choose to access those clinics and other people don't. So many of the clients have their own neurologists or some don't, some have just a GP and they're under the care of the GP. So being part of this team has been vital to the care that they're getting. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the strengths of the model. From my point of view, and I'm from everybody's point of view, the people with MND get better care. And that was the whole aim of the setting up this model of care. People, because different people were all working together, people are going out at different intervals and feeding that information back to everybody if they notice a deterioration. So if I go to see somebody and I notice that their speech has deteriorated, I contact the speech pathologist and let them know. Otherwise, maybe that person has a three-monthly appointment and the speech pathologist won't know things have changed unless the person actually contacts them. So just having different people coming in regularly really makes a difference. So the people are being seen much more regular and where everyone is keeping an eye on what's happening. I think there's more streamlined service for members. As I don't know, I've worked in health and in different, different capacities, but I find that often you're just involved with your side of things, your perspective, looking at speech, but you don't know the holistic, what's happening, how is that person getting cared for when you're not there? So having that partnership is really, really good, and it's more streamlined because everyone is keeping everyone abreast of what's happening. So if I know someone's just been out there yesterday and I know that everyone's okay, I'll know that maybe that's not the most immediate appointment I need to go. And often we actually do combine visits, so that's actually really good as well because it can cut down the number of people that are actually going in to see someone, which can be very tiring for people. Um, there's lack of duplication of service, and Gina mentioned that's a very good cost-cutting thing. It's also it's about people's time as well as everything else. Um, people are stretched as it is, so the lack of duplication is really, really beneficial. And I think this is probably one of the most important points. It gives us all a forum to debrief with colleagues. And I think if everyone that's here realised how complex it is working with people with MND, it's very challenging and it can be very emotional. So having a forum to be able to debrief and problem solve and support each other, you can't underestimate how beneficial that is. Um, professional development for all team members because we learn from each other. I only came into this role a year and a half ago and just having access to this team from the very beginning just made my job so much easier. I was able to know who the people involved were, who to, I immediately had forged those relationships and that really, really helped me in my job. And for any new physiotherapist or anybody that comes on the scene, it's the same for them. It's a mentoring, forum, it's really, really beneficial because they're immediately slotted in to know who's who and gets the contact details of everybody. Um, it's a great place to disseminate any new information any of us have, anything that we can assist with or different SIG workshops that are coming up. We can let people know and how people can be supported. And Janelle mentioned this, the pooling of resources. We do have some support through our equipment service and different things like FlexiRest, but when everybody, when a problem is brought up, everybody looks at it from their own perspective and different people can help at different times. So it's really, really good having that collaborative approach. So that multidisciplinary approach is really, really helpful. And it's amazing how the sum of many rather than the one can, can happen. All right. 
more effective, <laughs> more effective communication between health professionals. I think that's, I'm someone on the outside trying to access health professionals and that can be some challenge sometimes. Just getting in to make that referral sometimes is really, really difficult. So letting people know that someone is going to be referred or often the health professionals are the people referring to our association. So that really sets up really good communication. And the strengthening the partnerships Look, we have more regular contact. I can ring up at any time and, and speak to the speech pathologist on that team because we know each other. It really sets up good working relationships. And the spin-off, we work with the um, community options team. We run a combined support group. So that's another way we all work. And the team are so generous with their time coming to be guest speakers at various different times at that support group. So look, I just want to really thank the commitment Carly for all she does at, at keeping us all on track and for all the people who participate in that. Um, my last comment is I was asked to say whether there's any weaknesses or how do we think the model is working. Well, we have nearly full attendance at every meeting. It's run bi-monthly and I think that speaks for itself. We also have an annual um, review. It's always very positive. So people are obviously getting a lot out of it and this model is working for us. And I know that different people run more regular meetings, but we think bi-monthly works well because people are already stressed and overstretched. So the bi-monthly model works for us. Thank you. I would now like to introduce Julie Labra, who's the MND Clinic Coordinator at St Joseph's Hospital, and she'll speak about the MND Clinic at St Joseph's. Welcome, Julie. Um, can I just get a show of hands, who has actually heard of St Joseph's MND service? Oh, okay, so more than I expected. <laughs> and has anyone actually had a patient linked to our service? A few people, okay. Um, so St Joseph's is a subacute hospital in Auburn. Um, we have rehab, palliative care and aged care psychiatry on site. <coughs> but our MND service actually comes under our rehab outpatient services. Now, how do I, move? do I just click this, Gina? Yeah. Um, so just an overview of the clinics in Sydney. Um, there is Macquarie Neurology, um, Prince of Wales Hospital at Ramwick, Calvary Hospital in Cogra, and St Joseph's out west. Um, so we see patients from Auburn out to Hills, Parramatta, Blacktown, Hawkesbury, Nepean, Blue Mountains, and down to Lithgow. So you'll notice on that map, as Anne was saying, that there is no clinic for people in the southwest of Sydney. So St Joseph's is, is actually a joint initiative between Joey's and Westmead Hospital, the neuro rehab, the neuro respiratory and gastro teams there, and, and also with MND New South Wales. The service origins. So, it, it, it all began in 2003 um, and there were a couple of key people involved in actually coming up with the concept of a service at Joey's because we were a little bit different because the, the bigger clinics were at um, North Shore and, and um, Prince of Wales initially were within an acute hospital. So we were kind of the first to do it in a much smaller subacute hospital. So Dr Joe Sandenham was the Director of Rehab at the time, worked very closely with Dr Paul Clouston, a neurologist at Westmead, um, and also with the MND Association. They came up with the idea. They then had a series of planning meetings with Allied Health, nursing, and as well as the neuro, respiratory, and, and gastro teams at Westmead. And they introduced a new funded position for an MND service nurse coordinator, 12 hours a week. Um, but all other medical, allied health and nursing teams involved received no allocated funding for their involvement in the service. So essentially they were kind of roped in. <laughs> um, but everybody could see the advantage of having multidisciplinary care for these people um, and a more efficient way of servicing these people. But I have to say it was probably Joe Sandenham down in the corner here who's actually now passed away. It was his very bubbly, persuasive personality, I think, and his connections that really got this up and running. 
Um, so a year after the concept was developed, the first clinic began in mid-2004 and initially we only had six patients registered but the referrals quickly came in. Um, in 2006 we actually changed the description of the coordinator's role to be eligible for not only a nurse but um, an allied health professional. So that's when poor sods, they've been stuck with me ever since because my background is actually a speech pathologist. I'm not a nurse like Margie and Sandra at the other clinics. Um, so to date we've had a total of 180 patients referred to the service and we've got 55 currently registered. Um, my position has recently been increased to three days a week and is now funded from three separate sources but all other staff involved remain unfunded despite a number of proposals to New South Wales Health. Okay, so who's the team? Um, this is the team that actually attend our clinic every month. So there's 15 staff members involved. It's a really big ordeal. You'll see the top line is all the medical staff involved. Um, I should point out the, the VIPs as I call them, Dr Morrison, is the Director of Rehab and Associate Professor Vucic, who's a neurologist from Westmead. Together they run our service. We have respiratory come over from Westmead to the clinic and we have the research team from Westmead also come over. Um, the middle line is our fabulous allied health team. I have to say that because they're sitting in the audience. <laughs> um, and then the bottom line, we have six people involved the, from nursing or support teams, uh, right down to our volunteer in the corner. And Deb, who's here as well from the MND Association, also comes to our clinic. Okay, so our model of care. We, when somebody's newly referred to our service, we aim to get them, get them into the clinic as soon as possible. Um, we run the clinic monthly and there's a maximum of seven patients per clinic. And we try to review the patients every three to six months, but it depends on how their condition is progressing um, and whether we can fit them in. Um, and when they come to clinic, they see a very large number of health professionals, but I have to stress to you that they only get about 10 minutes with each health professional. So if your patients come into our clinic, don't expect that they're gonna get a full assessment with a physio or that type of thing. It's really an interview, a screening, and then we refer back to the local allied health teams for specific interventions or assessments. And then between the clinics, my role is really to monitor people's overall function and make any arrangements if things are changing. Um, if the person, person is in our rehab outpatient catchment area, the clinic staff will do all of the outpatient work or home visits that are required. If somebody needs BiPAP, PEG, salivary gland, Botox injections, we send them over to Westmead Hospital. Um, so Dr. Peter Wu is the respiratory physician um, and Dr. Uh, Professor Vucic is the neurologist. Um, we have a very close link to those teams. It's challenging because they're off site and we're not working directly with them. So we have to have quite regular email, phone communication. So we also have the luxury at Joey's of being able to admit patients from the community straight onto our rehab unit for functional deteriorations or post-peg training. When someone has a peg put in at Westmead, they come straight over to us the next day and we keep them for usually about a week to train them how to use the peg. Um, we can also admit people straight onto our palliative care unit for symptom control or terminal care. Okay, so the strengths. So I have to emphasise that this model of care has taken us a number of years to establish. Um, we had a lot of teething issues to start with. Um, so some of the examples, you know, we really struggled initially to get our own palliative care team involved and to accept referrals for our MND patients and to get them involved earlier on in the piece instead of just doing the terminal care. So that has been a big work in process, in progress, um, but they're now very much involved. Um, we had some trouble getting gastro and respiratory to prioritise our patients. Um, 
but they're now on board with that and we have some processes in place. Uh, we went through a bit of a stage where if someone had an FVC less than 50%, gastro wouldn't even consider pegging the person. Um, so we had to work with gastro and respiratory on how to get a better process in place for those patients. But the biggest strengths of this model are the patient receives ongoing coordinated multidisciplinary care on a site that is much smaller and easier for people to access. Um, I haven't researched this yet but I'm certain we reduce the need for hospital admissions which is always traumatic for patients. Um, staff's high exposure to people with MND and their genuine interest in this caseload helps build their expertise which the patients really appreciate. And the teamwork is fabulous. And, and this is what really creates a wonderful staff satisfaction. And I think it helps with our burnout, or to avoid burnout for staff. Okay, so how can we improve? There's a number of things that we really do need to get better at. Um, one of the things, being a rehab-based service, we're not great at the palliative interventions in the clinic. Um, so advanced care planning is something that we really need to work on and we are going to this year. Um, timing our interventions, I think we could do better with that. Um, developing evidence-based approaches for managing symptoms. Um, we completely ignore sexuality. Um, we should be doing more home-based reviews, particularly for the 25% of our patients that can no longer attend clinics. Um, we don't have any psychology or counsellors. So, what have we learnt? Um, we've learnt, um, I've, I've wrote down three key things over the past 10 years, and I think really the importance of having a, a leader that that's, has vision and is passionate. Um, so I, I like to call these people VIPs. Having a VIP linked to your service is really crucial. Um, and whether that's a neurologist, a rehab specialist, a power care specialist, whoever it is that's interested. And, rec and recruiting staff that are also passionate and interested about this caseload is crucial. Um, the importance of building and maintaining relationships, both professionally and with your, with your patients. Um, so people aren't going to help out your patients when you're running to them, begging them to fit people in at very short notice, there's a crisis. You have to have a re good relationship with the people that you work with. They have to have a respect for you and your role. Um, and you have to really appreciate their input um, so that they will go that extra mile for your patient. And from a patient point of view, the biggest thing that I'm learning is don't rely on carers and patients to call you. So as often as I say to people, call me, call me, call me, they don't. Julie, we don't want to bother you. Julie, you're so busy. Um, so it's really important that you make the effort to review your patients regularly um, so that forward planning can occur and your interventions can be suitably timed. That's it. I'd now like to um, introduce Sue Ellen Hogg, who's the Senior Speech Pathologist from the Port Kembla Hospital, to talk about the model they have in, at Port Kembla. Welcome, Sue Ellen. Okay. So, as Gina said, my name is Sue Ellen, and I'm a speech pathologist who works in the Illawarra. I've been working with motor neuron disease caseloads for the past 10 years or so and it's been my interest in developing local services for people with MND that's actually led me into my current role as palliative care clinical project manager. So I'm not currently working as a speech pathologist. Today I'd like to share the story of how through persistence and seizing opportunities we were able to develop what was a very piecemeal and unsatisfactory MND service into a coordinated model that integrates palliative care from diagnosis. I need to acknowledge Liliana Baroni and Shelley Mason, who are dietitians that assisted me with this project. In fact, it was really the three of us who were so passionate about the care of our MND clients and distressed by the gaps that we saw in their care that we couldn't fix as speech pathologists and dietitians 
that we made it our mission to improve access to evidence-based care in the Illawarra through whatever means and whatever opportunities became available. So here's the story of our service. The Illawarra region stretches approximately 90 kilometres from Helensburg in the north to Fox Ground in the south and it forms the northern part of the Illawarra Shoalhaven Local Health District. On average, at any one time, we've got around 18 people living with MND in this area, and their care is managed by a multidisciplinary team based at Port Kembla Hospital, which is slightly south of Wollongong. This team consists of a dedicated palliative care allied health team who are involved with clients from diagnosis through disease progression. We have an integrated palliative care model with shared management by rehabilitation and palliative care from diagnosis. Care is coordinated through the use of care coordinators, monthly or bi-monthly MND specific and weekly palliative care case conferences as required, and through the use of uh, the palliative care outcomes collaboration assessment tools, which assist with communication between team members and also um, provide triggers to escalate care in a timely manner. But it hasn't always been this way. Only a few years ago, this is what an MND client's journey would look like as they attempted to act services in the Illawarra. Some patients would be referred down from a specialist MND clinic in Sydney, but a lot of patients would be referred straight from their GPs or neurologists to our rehabilitation specialist, or in the case of bulbar symptoms, straight to me. At which time I'd arrange a joint appointment with the dietitian and work on getting a referral to a Sydney clinic or neurologist or our rehab specialist facilitate membership to the association as quickly as we could. Meantime, they'd be linked to the support group and discussed at the case conference, which has been going for quite some time, every two months. And they could kind of go around that, that merry-go-round for quite a while. If they required physiotherapy, a doctor's referral was, was required, and they could be managed by one of three different physiotherapy teams, often moving between teams as their condition changed. For OT, there was a very long community waiting list and again clients were managed by one of four different OTs who were rarely able to attend the case conference due to caseload commitments. To make communication even harder, paper-based outpatient medical records were used and sat in each discipline's department, never to be shared, certainly not conducive to coordinated care. It's hard to believe, but as you can see in this model, there was absolutely there was no access to social work. So a lot of that work fell to the regional advisors and the rehab CNC, and on more than one occasion, the speech pathologist and dietitian. If patients were lucky, they may come in contact with palliative care, but this usually involved lots of chasing of requests for GPs or rehab specialists to make the referrals that were never timely and never coordinated. And so, after years of talking about the gaps and trying to be the advocate or fixer for individual clients, we realised that we needed to make a systems change and take a systematic approach to doing that. For, oops. First step, um, we submitted a proposal for a formal gap analysis to take place um, and we were able to secure a master's student in dietetics to help us with the methodology and the data analysis. We used surveys and structured patient care interviews to gain staff and consumer perspectives on what was and wasn't working. And not surprisingly, given the pathway I just showed you, they identified that care was siloed with a lack of coordination, lack of continuity and consistency. So depending on how you entered the service, your journey could be very different. Uh, they also identified lack of formal psychosocial support, not with no psychology or social work. But the biggest gap um, that family members identified was the lack of timely involvement from palliative care. When I reviewed the data over an 18 month period, I found that only 30% of our MND clients actually accessed palliative care and only 5% prior to the terminal phase. In addition to having huge implications for appropriate symptom management and quality of life, carers describe the stress associated with not having adequate medical support in the home when, te when conditions deteriorated rapidly and the distress of seeing their loved one admitted and sometimes die in an acute hospital. Patients, carers and clinicians alike all rated improving palliative care access on an earlier as a high priority. In addition to the patient and staff feedback, we also reviewed the literature to compare local care with that recommended for people with MND. 
And we were able to back up what staff and consumers were saying with evidence about the importance of a coordinated multidisciplinary approach and early palliative care on patient outcomes. We also identified another large gap in our uh, management of clients with, with respiratory impairments. So we know well, there's quite a bit of evidence to suggest that it would be appropriate to access non-invasive ventilation for people with respiratory impairment in MND and that it can improve survival and quality of life, but rarely were patients in the Illawarra offered this as an intervention. So we wrote up the needs assessment and presented at a range of local forums trying to raise awareness for our cause. The needs assessment was used to develop a business case in the hope that at some point an opportunity would arise to use it. And when the local health district was allocated COAG funding um, to increase community-based palliative care, I was able to use this business case uh, to campaign for MND clients to be incorporated into the scope of this service. This was able to guide allocation of resources. But long story short, it was eventually signed off. And within um, it's probably 12 months of, of work, we had access to a full-time occupational therapist, physiotherapist, social worker, ooh, Viv, up the back there, speech pathologist and dietitian, as well as a palliative care CNC and palliative care community-based medical registrar. Because we knew this funding was temporary, uh, we invested a lot of time in developing the service processes and pathways, as well as data collection to be able to demonstrate its effectiveness and success. We also realised that while processes and pathways were good, this was a big culture shift for the health professionals involved who were used to MND being managed by rehabilitation and palliative care only getting involved at the end. So we took the opportunity to utilise the support of MND New South Wales and held a local education day. MND New South Wales helped us to coordinate specialist clinicians, some of them are here today, to present information to back up the importance of early palliative care, multidisciplinary care and respiratory management. And finally, the penny dropped. For some reason, hearing it from external sources rang true, and both the rehabilitation and palliative care specialist approached me after, keen to progress the integrated approach and formalise a pathway of care. So, uh, through persistence and some op opportunistic timing, we now have a dedicated community palliative care team to manage MND clients from diagnosis, which of course includes social work, and by referring to one discipline, you now gain access to all. This includes access to after hours nursing care in the home when required and access to the palliative care equipment local. And by being registered with um, palliative care early, patients and families are provided with information and can opt in and out along the way as needed or desired rather than just at the point of crisis. And so the pathway looks something like this. Um, again, referrals can still come from a variety of sources, but once referred, access to all disciplines is consistent and coordinated. As I mentioned, uh, outcomes were always going to be um, important for ensuring ongoing funding for this team. And by demonstrating um, the number of palliative care patients supported to die at home had increased since the implementation of this palliative care team, we have received commitment from our LHD that this team will be funded on an ongoing basis. For MND clients, this, this actually meant that patients were supported to die in their location of choice, which wasn't always at home. Uh, and often patients would choose to come into the palliative care unit, um, but certainly avoided them having to um, be admitted into an acute hospital. And I need to finish by saying that while we've come a long way, this service is nowhere near perfect. And if I was to look at the things that we still need to improve, I could come up with dozens. Um, we have made great progress, but we still need um, a, quite a bit of work in the management of respiratory um, impairment in MND. And I'd like to see a time where we, we're able to hold ourselves accountable across the whole district, not just the north in the Illawarra, but down in the Shoalhaven, um, and make sure that because there's now no reason why people can't access this care, that we make sure that they are accessing it in a timely basis all the time. So that's it. And our final speaker. <coughs> Is 
speakers, I should say, are from Port Macquarie. So we've got Kylie Ballantyne, um, who uh, is a senior community physiotherapist from Port Macquarie-based hospital, and she's going to be presenting with Eileen O'Loughlin, who's the regional advisor for the Greater Newcastle and Mid-North Coast, and they're going to talk about the Port Macquarie group. Thank you. Okay, um, we're a very small team up in Port Macquarie and we're fragmented in that the um, staff that are involved in the management of our um, MND clients all come from different teams. We're located in different buildings and different geographical areas so our story is just of a really simple approach to try and improve communication and care for our MND clients. So our team is made up of palliative care nurses, allied health professionals and case managers who, as I said, work from a number of different teams and locations. And we also have our wonderful regional advisor, Eileen, who is our main source of referrals and also for us a person to share information but also get a lot of support from. So we all try to communicate regularly, but staff being located in different places, as someone else has also already mentioned, we all had separate medical records which never met up with one another. So our system wasn't foolproof. We had lots of situations where care was confused, things were doubled up, referrals were made to other disciplines, external services where those issues had already been addressed, already looked at. Um, so it really wasn't very efficient. So a couple of years ago I came up with just the really simple idea of trying to organise a multidisciplinary case prep meeting. Um, I tried to make it as simple and as, as accessible as possible. So you could come in person, you could phone in, you could email a handover, or if there was someone else going, you could give a handover to them to bring on your behalf. And I asked Eileen to be involved as well because she was able to provide a really unique insight into the issues that some of our MND patients and also their carers were experiencing. And she was also a wonderful source of support and information for us professionals. So our meetings take place monthly. Um, they take place in my tiny little office. And the discussion is basically based around a framework that we've come up with, which is aimed at covering all the possible issues and areas that might need discussion for our patients. Um, I type up a summary at, for each client at the end of that meeting, which I send out to all the professionals involved in that patient's care and also to Eileen um, with our patient's permission, but we also send them to external case managers and to the patient's GP. So in our area, most of our patients don't see a neurologist, certainly regularly many of them won't, won't see one at all, and so our patients are managed by their GP and by us, the multidisciplinary team. So by having these regular meetings and then actually typing up a summary which is distributed to everyone, it means everyone gets a regular update on exactly what's happening with that patient. Some other positives that came out of having these meetings was that it created a source of education for us professionals. For all of us, motor neuron is just a small part of our caseload. It's not our area of expertise. It also provided, as someone else has already mentioned, an invaluable forum for brainstorming. These patients are often complex. There could be complex family issues, complex medical issues. So it's just brilliant to have a monthly opportunity with a whole lot of people getting together, putting all of our minds to work and try, trying to come up with holistic solutions, but also making sure that everybody's then on the same page so the communication to the patient and the family is consistent. It's helped us to identify a key worker for our patients at any given time, even though they do change over time. And finally, in our area, we don't have a speech pathologist. Uh, we do have a speech pathologist. We don't have a social worker. And our access to speech pathology is really, really limited. So it meant that our speech, you could come to this meeting once a month. They could get a snapshot of exactly what's happening with their patients. And they could give the rest of the team advice on management things for the patients, but it also helped them to prioritise who they needed to get to most urgently. <laughs> and finally, I think we all understand each other's roles a lot better, and we've learned a lot about options for our patients, which are maybe outside of each of our scopes of expertise. So it's made us a lot more holistic, 
and it also gives us a really good network of people to go to to debrief, to look after ourselves, but also to look for ideas for our patients. So I'll hand over to Eileen. So, firstly, I would like to thank Kylie for her commitment in regards to organising the Port Macquarie multidisciplinary team meetings. And thank you to all the health professionals who have attended or have been involved in these meetings. So across New South Wales, there are many geographic areas of health. And as regional advisors, we become familiar with the divisions within our area. It is often challenging for us to establish where allied health services come from and the appropriate pathways for referrals. Is it from a base hospital? or is it from a community health centre, or is it from an ACAT team or some other package of care. Although there is some crossover from where allied health professionals come from in the Port Macquarie area, the meetings are useful in informing me of changes that are happening, such as new staff or changes within the allied health team. It also helps identify gaps and provides an environment where discussions can occur. The multidisciplinary team meetings that Kylie has organised, there is no measurable outcome. However, as a regional advisor, I feel these meetings are extremely beneficial, assisting health professionals to provide the best possible consistent care for members living with MND in the Port Macquarie area. This model of care highlights a multidisciplinary team approach. And research has shown that although there is no cure for MND, multidisciplinary care can help people living with MND to live better for longer. And as Kylie has already mentioned, most MND members in the area are managed by their GP, <coughs> choosing not to have a follow-up by a neurologist after diagnosis. I am aware that many people also in other areas that have good access to neurologists do not have follow-up by neurologists. But in the port area, the main reason is there is no resident neurologist. There are only two visiting neurologists who have clinics monthly, one in Kempsey, which is one hour north of Port Macquarie, and one in Foster, which is one hour south. So some members will travel to MND clinics in Sydney, but very few. So as a regional advisor, I find these meetings invaluable, ensuring that members living with MND have been informed and discussions have occurred in regards to symptom management. It also gives me the opportunity to support health professionals by providing information about symptom management, as well as providing an environment for health professionals to debrief and to be reassured that they are doing all they can to manage sometimes complex symptoms. The diagnosis of MND impacts on the whole family. These meetings provide a sounding board, ensuring that issues affecting the family can be discussed or at least highlighted. For example, why are there barriers to accepting services? And another challenge we have in the Port Macquarie area is its smaller population. There is often discussion between members, um, along with questions such as, why has this service not been offered to me? Or why can't I have the same level of personal care? So if all staff involved are aware of the current issues, consistent information or answers can be provided to the family, hopefully allowing for better outcomes. The meetings also make my home visits to members much easier, allowing me to be informed of changes in health and who has been doing what. I'm not always able to be in the Port Macquarie area at the time of the meetings, but if I cannot be present, I participate by using teleconference. Um, so once again, I would like to hand back to Kylie. So like everyone else, I was also asked to talk about the weaknesses of our system. Um, and the downside, I guess, for us is it is a lot of work. Um, Organising the meetings, gathering the handovers, typing up the summaries, sending them out. But we all believe that it is really important. I will also say it is absolutely impossible to find a day and time of the week that everybody can actually get there. So it is always going to mean that people are contributing via handovers, phone, email, whatever. Um, so to make sure that it was actually a valuable use of our time, I did do a bit of an informal survey a little while ago and all of the staff that are actually participating in the meetings all came back and said, look, they're really valuable, they make a big difference, we definitely want them to continue. 
I also contacted all of the GPs of our current and past patients, not really expecting a response, but I was actually really pleasantly surprised that most of the GPs took the time to make contact and said that they really appreciated getting that monthly summary snapshot of all the different issues that were happening with their patient, all the different people who were involved, what they were looking at, what they were following up, and they also said it actually gave them a much better insight into what all of us do, so that's got to be a positive. So we're still having our meetings monthly. Um, they're still in my little office. We don't get any additional funding. Not everybody can make it every time, but everybody does make an effort to contribute a bit of a handover, and we feel that it does make a big difference to the communication, the holistic care of our patients, and also the support for us um, to each other as professionals and um, with Eileen. So I'd just like to thank everyone in my area for committing and still supporting the meetings and hope that might give people a few ideas in their area. Thank you.